It's Wednesday night, and we're back to the study of predestination. And people will say, why do you study on this every week? Well, predestination is the very essence of salvation. Salvation has to do with God causing us to be like Christ, which is actually faith, because faith works. Faith works by agape, or by love. And agape, of course, you've got two words, agape and phileo. Both of these have been translated into the one word, love, L-O-V-E in the English, and they're both two different words. Phileo means to have affection and uh, to like something, like I like cake, or I like God, I like my dog, and uh, I like God, I like my wife, I like to fish. But agape has to do with obedience to a commandment, obedience. And, of course, you hear, you hear Baptists and Church of Christ talk about agape. Agape is a godly love, and they don't have any idea what they're talking about. Because Second John 6 tells us, anytime you have a word... In the scripture, always look for the textual definition. Look for the definition in the text. In, I, had a, I used to call this one Greek professor whenever I'd have questions about things and uh, years ago. And he would say from time to time to me, he would say, you're going to find just as much definition in the textual meaning. That means where it sets in the scripture as you are in the definition of the word itself. It's kind of like prayer. Prayer, prosuchamai, means to will forward. You'll find P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-O-M-A-I. Whenever you're reading the Bible, look at the context definition as well as the Greek or Hebrew definition. Prosuchamai is the word prayer. Well, you have a, a Greek definition, which is pros and UK. Uh, this word prosukamai comes from pros in UK. Pros means toward. And when we say, when the Greek text is pros, it's our word pro. It means for or toward. If you say pro-life, it means for or toward life. Uh, UK means to will or desire. And of course, whenever I've said this, I want you to get a hold of the idea that I'm not just talking about the Greek definition, but I'm talking about the definition in context of Scripture. Well, prayer means to will toward the will of another. It means to bow to the will of God. And then Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, he says, When you pray, pray after this manner, Our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He says, this is what you pray. Pray for the will of God in your life. And that is the word... That's the word prayer every time you find it in the New Testament Greek text. Uh, and whether people like it, it's either prosuke, which one is the verb and the other is the noun. Prayer is the word prosukamai. And to pray is prosuke. And one is the verb, the other is the noun. So you have a context. And Jesus said, we are to pray thy will be done. So, and then he went to the garden and he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. And this is what Jesus prayed. And this is what he tells us to pray. We pray this. He prayed this. And that's the definition of the word. The. <laughs> you know. Why don't we look at the word, look at the context. Well, then when you get into agape, uh, the Bible says this is agape. This is agape. Or this is love, is what it says in the King James Bible. But you have to know, it's not saying this is phileo. It's not saying this is phileo. And you have to go look at the text. And, have, and before long, you'll get to where you know the difference between the two without looking it up. Except in certain cases. So you need to look it up anyway. So when he says, this is love, Second John 6... Well, if this is love, what he's saying, here is what equals to love. Or love, or agape, equals. Here's what agape is equal to. It equals walking after his commandments. This is love, this is agape, that we walk after 
his commandments. Well, there is an axiom in algebra that things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other, and you can substitute equals for equals anywhere you find them. So agape is equal to walking after his commandments. Therefore, anytime you find agape, you can substitute its equal for the word agape wherever you find it, can't you? You can actually substitute walking after his commandments everywhere you find agape. Well, the Bible says, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. And it says, love your enemy. And it says, God is love. And it also says, for God so loved, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it also says, uh, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son he receives. Okay, love your neighbor, love your enemy. God is love. God so loved the world. And it says, Jacob, have I loved and Esau, have I hated before they were born, before they had done any good or evil. Well, each time you find this word love in any of these verses, it is either the verb form or it is or it is the noun form of agape. Not one of these is phileo. It doesn't mean God has an affection for. It doesn't mean have an affection for your neighbor. Have an affection for your enemy. Uh, God is like. He likes everybody. That's not what it means. Uh, God so liked the world. That's not what it says. Whom the Lord liked. Or had an affection for. That's not what it says. Jacob have I had an affection for. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So Israel have I loved, or since agape is equal to walking after the commandments of God, you can substitute equals for equals. You can substitute walk after the commandments since it equals to love. You can substitute walk after the commandments of God everywhere you find agape, can't you? So, when the Bible says, love your neighbor, it means to walk in the commandments of God in front of your neighbor, tell them the truth, give them the truth, do what the Bible says concerning them. It doesn't mean like your neighbor, like everybody, like the thief that breaks into your house and burns your house down, kills your wife and dog and your kids. Like them, and I want to forgive him. And you see these people on TV, and they're on uh, uh, Most Wanted, or their own American Justice, and they're saying... Well, they killed my brother, and, and I love my brother so much, but I want to be a Christian, and I just want to forgive them. I forgive you. And the guy's up there growling on the... It's sitting back there being tried, and he's going, ah, I hate the world. I want to kill everybody. <laughs> You're not supposed to like him. That's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible is saying, tell him the truth. Rebuke him. That's loving him, isn't it? If it's walking after the commandments of God... Well, what does that mean, walk after his commandments? Does that mean walk after the Ten Commandments? Well, yes. But that's not all there is to the commandments of God. Every time you find an imperative mood in the Greek, an imperative mood, that's a commandment. An imperative is a command. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. You've got four types of sentences. I learned this somewhere about the eighth or the ninth grade. I can't remember where it was. 
Remember, you have four types of sentences that you'll learn in English. You have a declarative. And that is, ends with a period. Or it's a statement. Statement. And it's like uh, I used to say, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the sun is shining. That, that's a statement. That's just a declarative statement. Or you have, and you have a question or an interrogative. Interrogative comes from, we get the word interrogate from interrogative. It's not a hard word. An interrogative is uh, you get a guy in a room and you interrogate him and it's interrogative. That's what you're doing. That's an interrogative or it's a question. It ends in a question mark. And uh, when I'd come into the house and Eric was about 16, I'd say, Mary, did Eric take out the garbage? That's the question. And then you have an exclamation exclamation and that ends in a exclamation point and when Eric would take out the garbage and I didn't ask him I'd go Eric took out the garbage that's an exclamation but an imperative is a command now when the Bible when whenever I would say Eric take out the garbage that wasn't an invitation it wasn't a question and it wasn't a statement. It was a command. Now that's what a command is. Anytime you find these, whenever the Bible says, humble yourselves under the hand of God, that's not, that's not a question. And that's not an invitation. When the Lord told Matthew, follow me, when he tells us, if any man will come after me, Luke 9, 23, let him take up his cross deny himself and follow me. Every one of those are imperatives. When he would say strive to enter in at the straight gate, the word is agonizomai. It's the word agonize. Agonizomai. That's an imperative. Agonize over your sin. If you don't agonize over your sin, somewhere in your life, you don't know God. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Because when the Bible says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. That's an imperative too. Hear. God's not inviting anybody to hear because the hearing ear and the seeing eye, <coughs> the Lord hath made even both of them. If a man can hear, it's because God gave him an ear to hear. If a man is deafened, God hasn't given him an ear to hear. <clears throat> when he says, let him hear. We've got many, many of these imperatives. When he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Well, if agape is walking in the commandments of God, and you're supposed to love your enemy, you're going to do all this in front of your enemy. How about rebuke him? Oh, that's an imperative. How about when evil men come and they're preaching false doctrine and the Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 26, be angry. People say, Jim Brown, you're just too angry. No, I'm not. I'm, I am commanded by God to be angry at false doctrine. How about withdraw from people who walk disorderly? Withdraw. Those people, those people who are preach another doctrine, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. We are to stay away from them. We are to mark them which cause these divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines that we have learned. And we are to avoid them. Eklino is the word. It means to go out of your way to stay away from them. We're supposed to, we're supposed to stay away from them. All these words are imperative moods. Or they come from words that are imperatives. So whenever the Bible says agape is walking in the commandments of God, it's all these and much more. You're saying, Jim, do I have to find out what all the imperatives of God are? Well, no. 
they will find you out. <laughs> and it will come alive in you and God will write it in your heart and you'll be doing them and you'll be so uncomfortable. And what makes people uncomfortable, they're saying, I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm supposed to love my enemy and I don't even like this guy. What am I going to do? You're not supposed to like him. If he won't walk right and if he doesn't walk in truth, you're supposed to live in truth around them, tell them the truth. If they preach a false doctrine, you are to be angry at them. And when you are angry at them, you are loving them, aren't you? When you are withdrawing from them, you are loving them. Because in, First Thess in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 14, the Bible says, If any man doesn't walk according to this book, note that man and have no fellowship with him, that he may be ashamed. <coughs> so when you withdraw from a person that is not living righteously, then you are loving him because you're wanting God to deal with him in his shame. You don't just keep patting him on the back and getting along with him and say, I like you and I, well, brother, I know you're, you're not really want to be that way, but I love you in spite of it all. We're to withdraw from them so that they'll be ashamed and they'll come back around. That's what I've needed in my life. I had a niece out in, I still have one, out in Arizona. She's about 40 now. And she said, when I was young, name's Lynn, and she said, I grew up, Mama, I took piano, and she took all of the classics, and she'd sit and play the classic piano, and she'd play in church and play the bells in church, and it's a Southern Baptist church. And she, she said, uh, I knew that what I was doing was wrong, but because she came on so sweet, it's like such a sweet Christian girl, her mom would pat her on the head and say, I know you don't mean to do these things, and... And Lynn ended up in drugs of all kinds and drinking by the time she was 15 and she was just living this wild life. And she looked like this real sweet little Christian girl. People are not at all what you think they are. And she ended up this sweet little Christian girl and her mom was just patting her on the head and her mom would, my sister, her mama would, uh, whenever somebody would say damn or hell in front of them, she'd stick her fingers in their ears real quick. Like, the words already come out, Janice. You know. And she kept pretending that Lynn couldn't hear, didn't know what was going on. She really is as innocent as she looked. Well, she ended up moving in with a drug dealer, and her mama's still saying she's... She ended up moving in with this drug dealer, and she ended up with a shootout with the cops and sitting in the back seat loading the pistols for her boyfriend while he was shooting at the cops. And this is a sweet, uh, a sweet little Christian girl, and she looked just as sweet as she could be. And I said, somebody tell you, Lynn, you need to repent. She said, that's what I needed to hear. She said, I knew that I needed to hear that. But everybody was patting her, saying, we know you're a sweet little girl, and you wouldn't do these things. You separate from her. I don't care how sweet they look. That's when you love them. But my sister thinks if you stick them in a Christian school and stick your fingers in the air after the cuss words have been said, that'll help them. No, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a great believer in Christian schools because they're not Christian. You go to some Baptist school, they teach a Baptist doctrine and you can't wear a belt and you can't, if you don't have a belt on, they, Eric went to a Christian school, what, one semester here in Hendersonville. They made him drive home in a, in a rainstorm to get a belt because he didn't have a belt. He forgot his belt that day. And if he'd had a wreck and got in the hospital, I mean, all over a belt. It's foolishness. And some little girl, one guy said at the same school, she had on a sleeveless dress, and they got her up in front of the class and said she was dressed like a harlot. And she got to crying. And, you know, they deserve a kick in the tail for that. And I'm not, a, I'm not high on Christian schools. Just don't care for them. First of all, your kids are going to have to face the world somewhere, aren't they? Well, then where do they need to learn? From you. Teach them at home so they can go face the world in the fifth and sixth grade. 
Don't, don't wait till they're in the, in the 11th or 12th grade. Okay, we're going to put them in a state of shock by putting them in a public school. They go, ah, oh, I didn't know this was out here. But they do. But they do. So, when we, we're predestined to conform to the likeness of Jesus. And his likeness is loving his neighbor. And we love our enemy. We, you don't love your enemy. That doesn't mean give them ice cream and cake and a day at the beach and a day off and a paid vacation. That's not what that means. It means walking all the commandments of God in front of them. Humble under the hand of God. Do what you're supposed to do in front of them. And God is all of these things in us. And much, much more And all those things that you feel about love. That's not what it is. <laughs> Hasn't everybody had that contradictory feeling? I'm supposed to love, I thought I was supposed to love my enemy. I've had a hard time liking them. You're not supposed to like them. God doesn't like them. He hated Esau before he was born. And over the 139th Psalm, David said, Lord, I want to hate those that you hate with a perfect hatred. Well, that don't sound like Christianity, does it? Huh? I hate men who hate God's Word. I have nothing for them. And people say, you're just too angry at, at your fellow preachers, Kenneth Copeland and, and Fred Price and Creflo Dollar and Oral Roberts. They're not my brothers and they're not preachers of the gospel. They preach the doctrine of the devil, don't they? That's what they preach. And when the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, oh, Whoever he has given his commandments to, to walk in, and he writes it on fleshy tables of our hearts. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves in Hebrews the 12th chapter, he chastens and scourges every son he received. The word scourge there is the word mastix, M-A-S-T-I-X. It comes from the word M-A-S-T-I-G-O-O, which is the, verb, the noun form. And, uh, and the, uh, Mastigao was the Roman flagellum that had the pieces of glass and bone through the whip. And they'd whip a man and rip his back to shreds. God says, I beat my people with a bloody beating. Because he's beating self out of us, isn't he? <coughs> and then he says in that same text, If you be without chastisement and you're not getting the scourge of God, you are a bastard and no son of of mine. Therefore, if you're a bastard, note, notice this, if you're a bastard in an illegitimate child and you don't belong to God, not only do you not get scourged, but he doesn't love you. Because if he loves you, he scourges you. And he said, if you're without the scourge, you're a bastard. Therefore, he doesn't love you. You don't belong to God. You never have and you never will. So whenever we're talking about love, we're talking about his commandments. When he says, Jacob have I loved, he's saying, I gave my commandments to Jacob. Isn't that what he's saying? That's what he's saying. Now, Mr. Strong gives a bad definition of hate. Esau have I hated, and it will say love less. That's a bad definition. Because love is walking in the commandments of God. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean, Esau, have I given less of the commandments of God, does it? If, if love is giving the commandments, then loving less would be giving less of the commandments, right? I only gave Esau, who were the Edomites, south, that was where the Herods were from. I only gave them four of the commandments of God. But I gave uh, Jacob ten commandments and I gave Esau four. No. No, it means, and you have to go back. When you see Esau have I hated, as it is written there in verse 13 of Romans 9, when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, not of works, but of him that called us, it was by the purpose of God that according to election might stand, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, and that's quoted from 
Malachi, the first chapter, the first two verses. I'll quit dropping that in a minute. Uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So you have to go back to where it is written, as it is written, don't you? So you go back to Malachi. If something is quoted from somewhere else, don't you go back to the original quotation? Huh? So we have to go back to Malachi. When, you, when you're quoting Romans 9.13, and it says, Esau, as it is written, Esau have I hated, you don't go with the Greek definition here. You need to go back to where it's originally quoted in Malachi, the first chapter. Go back to the original word and find out what the word was there, right? Well, the word there is the word S-A-N-E. It looks like sane, but it's pronounced sana, S-A-W-N-A-W. And it means, it means to detest or despise or be disgusted with. God said, I was repulsed at Esau before he was born because I was going to make him a vessel of wrath and fit him for destruction and make him wicked and evil. I'm going to make him that way. Now that bothers people. So Jacob have I given my commandments to. And what's amazing, Jacob's name was changed to Israel in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. And who got the commandments of God in the Old Testament? Jacob. Israel got the commandments of God when they were leaving Egypt, didn't they? Who gets these commandments of God, these imperatives? It's written on fleshy tables of our heart. God writes it on the heart of all the elect and we're elected to obey God and to be rebuked of God, to be angry at sin, to withdraw from people who walk disorderly, to follow, to akulatheo, be in the same way with him, to up or neomai, to deny or contradict self, to take up arrow, uh, to humble ourselves, uh, all of these, to agonize, to hear, akuo, to enter, isarkomai, rebuke, uh, elenkos, we're, we're commanded all these things. This is what we do to our enemy. And this has been one of the most confusing words. And I go through that once in a while to say, hey, this is what people think. People say, doesn't God love everybody? Isn't God have a love, benevolent attitude towards the world? Absolutely not. He does not. <coughs> Had a lady call me and she said, does God actually want evil to happen yes yes he does why look over in Psalms 76 <coughs> now this is a hard thing to understand you've got to quit trying to figure God out by a 21st century method of thinking God does not love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau. But when you say God doesn't love everybody, you're not saying God doesn't like everybody, even though he doesn't like everybody. That's not what we're saying. We're saying God does not agape everybody or agape everybody. He doesn't write the commandments in everybody's heart in the world, does he? No. If he loved everybody, he'd do that. And if he loved everybody, he'd scourge them and make them behave. But you don't make the, you don't make the kids next door behave, do you? All right, you kids, come here and go to bed. John and Bill over there, you're not our daddy. We don't live there. Right, what are you are? Well, you're going to come in here and eat over here. You're going to come in here and go to bed here. You don't do that to the people's, the kids next door. And, who did Jesus say that the Pharisees belonged to? Who did he say their father was? He said, your father is the devil. The works of your father you will do. You're going to grow up and be like your father over there. He sells sin for a living. He's a field rep for sin, sin the sin factory. And that's what you're going to do. You don't belong to me. Get out of my house. God doesn't, not only does he love everybody, he don't even like everybody. Why would he? People think God is up in heaven, wringing his hands, 
walking the corridors of heaven. Oh, I wish I could just get everybody to do what I want to do, and I just don't know what to do. I, I'm only God, and I don't know what to do to get them. I wish I would do that. I love you so much. Now I'm going to have to send you hell and cry for eternity. <laughs> you believe that's what God's doing? No, no. When he sends men to hell, he likes it. He wants to show his wrath and make his power known. And he endures with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. We don't sit around. You know the only people that sit around arguing about whether God loved Jacob or hated Esau. Whether he loves one hates the other. That's the people he hates that sits around arguing about it. They don't like the idea that God would actually do that. I might be one of those vessels of wrath. I don't like that idea, so I'm going to, I'm going to preach that God loves everybody until I get God to like it, everybody. You preaching, it ain't going, to help, ain't going to help you and ain't going to make God love you. What we do as believers, we realize what sinners we are and what hell we deserve, and we throw ourselves on the mercy of God and say, oh, God, thank you for choosing me. I don't know why, if in eternity, you'll ever show me that. Now, People will say, does God want or does God sin? No. First of all, I don't know what got me on this subject, but does God sin? Well, sin is, sin is the transgression of the law, of law. That's what 1 John 3 and 4 says. Sin is the transgression of the law. Well, if sin is the transgression of the law, who is the law made for? For God? Is God under the law? Well, no. When the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, does God say, I shall not kill? No, he can kill who he wants to. He said, I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. The keys of death and hell are given to Jesus. Our God sits in the heavens, he does whatsoever he pleased. And he killed people all through the Old Testament. He killed many innocent people. Didn't he? <clears throat> when David numbered Israel, God killed 70,000 Israelites, innocent people that had done nothing. God said, I'll kill them, and I'll do it to punish you, David. Oh, man, now that's hard to get a hold of, isn't it? I'm going to kill these innocent people. God says, I do that. And then the Bible says, God told the angel that was killing all of these people in Israel because of David's pride in numbering Israel. God told the angel, step back, and he withdrew his hand from the evil that he had brought against Israel. The Bible said, God brought the evil. People said, God don't do that. Yes, he does. Now, this is something really hard to grasp and get a hold of. People say, but does God sin? No, God can kill who he wants. People say, but God wouldn't commit murder, and God wouldn't, he wouldn't commit uh, uh, a lot of havoc to happen. And all through the Old Testament, God would call, he would call the Babylonians against Israel to slaughter and butcher them, where they would be rape and murder and pillaging and babies ripped out of the bellies of the women. And God says, I'm going to bring the king of Babylon against Israel and cause them to do this. Who did the sin? The Babylonians. Was God in charge? Yes. Did God order it? Yes. But God didn't sin. You say, that doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense to you. The Bible teaches that God can't sin, that he's perfect. He's righteous in whoever he wants to die, and he can kill who he wants and use whatever means he wants to do it. And he's still not a sinner. In fact, it was God that ordered the murder of Jesus, wasn't it? He sure did. When the Bible says that Herod was there the day that Jesus died, and Pilate was there the day that Jesus died, and the Gentiles were there, and that's the Roman soldiers, and they were screaming, and, and they were making fun of him and laughing at him and jeering at him and punching him. And the Jews were there that day screaming, Crucify him! And all those four sets of people were there, and the Bible says they were therefore to do whatsoever thy hand or God's hand and counsel determined before to be done. Determined before is the word prohorizo. It is the word predestinate. God predestinated Jesus' murder by evil men. God ordered it. God ordered Jesus' murder. Now this is what we can't get a hold of. 
God ordered Jesus' murder if a head of a mafia family orders men's murder. In our courts, we hold the man that ordered the murder more responsible than the men who pulled the trigger, don't we? The men who pulled the trigger might get 25 years to life, and the guy that ordered the murder is going to get the electric chair. But with God, when he orders the murder, he is blameless. And the men that are to be blamed, that he puts it in their hearts to murder Jesus. And Jesus said, now try to get a hold of this. Jesus said in John 10 concerning the parable of the good shepherd, no man takes my life from me, I lay my life down. You're going, I can't hardly get a hold of that. You have to remember our ways aren't, God's ways, his thoughts aren't our thoughts, and we can't think like God thinks. We're going to have to get out of our mind 20th, well, not just 20th and 21st century thinking. We're going to have to get out of our mind Americanized thinking. God's not an American. Boy, now that'll make Republicans mad, won't it? <laughs> Especially Sean Hannity, you're a great American. I don't know what a great American is. He is an imbecile. Now, look at this. I, this is the hard thing to get a hold of. Look in verse 10 of chapter 76 of Psalms. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The word wrath is the word kima, C H E M A H. Kima. And it means heat or anger or poison or rage. The rage of man when he goes out to do evil and wicked things is going to praise God up to a point. And I tried to explain this to this lady the other day. It's going to praise God up to a point. And he tells you what the point is. The remainder of wrath, the word remainder, shareth. S-H-E-E-R-I-Y-T-H. S-H-E-E-R-I-Y-T-H. The residual, the part of wrath that don't praise God, shalt thou restrain. It means to hold back. It's the word kagar. <clears throat> C-H-A-G-A-R. It, it means to uh, restrain or hold back or set aside. The part, now here's the whole thing. What will praise God, there will, without, I like what Thomas Watson said. He said, God wouldn't allow evil to happen unless he can be praised in it. And all the evil that goes on in the world and all the sin that goes on is the amount he wants to go on. It's kind of like, let me show you something. If God put in us sin, sin nature, and he did, and you are a, uh, it's kind of like, kind of like a piston in, a, in an engine. When that piston, when the cylinder, the gas goes in and the, in, the, in the cylinder fires and it pushes that rod that connects to the crankshaft, it pushes it down. It has to, when that cylinder fires, that piston has to push and turn that crankshaft, doesn't it? It has to. It's kind of like that in our lives. God puts the fire there. He puts, the fire is like a picture of sin. He put us in sin, gave us a sin nature, and put us in these bodies. And it's kind of like we're, uh, you're this spring here. You're like, here's a spring. This is like sin. And you're this piston, or you're this, this, that little valve. You're that little valve. Let's just say you're a little valve. And everywhere there's an opening that big. And this is a picture of sin in your life. And this is a valve. And God's just moving you up and down. He's moving you up and down. And every, everywhere there's an opening for that valve. And this is committing sin. 
everywhere that valve is, everywhere that opening for that valve to, to plunge down. And God's got this spring that you can't resist, and that's sin, and this is committing sin, and this is you. And God keeps moving you up and down this thing. You're boing, and you have to boing, and you sin. Because it's what you have to do. It's your nature. You understand what I'm saying? And God's going to hold you accountable because you do it. And he won't let it happen right here because there's no opening for sin right there. And there's some sin down in here, some sin down in here, but there ain't no opening for it. So that he's going to restrain that for the fact he makes no opening. But the fact that he opens it up and says, there, you have to go do it. Don't you? And the mouth, the mouth that won't praise God in, I look at my life and how that it's, how that I've lived this sinful life and how that God brought me through that. And I look back at it and I say, I wouldn't go through that for a billion dollars, but I wouldn't take a billion dollars for the experience because it's made me what I am today. And boy, that would be terrible to have to live again. I couldn't stand living it one more time. It'd kill me before I was a week into it knowing where I was going to have to go through if God let me know. I just sit there and have a heart attack right off the bat. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, uh, remember, evil men are the hand of God. And you know, you know what a lathe is. You got a little, you got a little, uh, a little. You put a little, uh, you put a piece of wood on a lathe. You put a piece of wood on it, and God's got His hand up here. And he's got this chisel on this lathe. He's got this chisel. And he's holding it with his hand. And everywhere, and Satan is like the chisel. And Satan is evil men. And David said, deliver me from the wicked which is thy sword in thy hand. And God has got our life, and this is our life. And our life is spinning and going like that. And God is taking Satan and going, stop. And he starts carving. And he carves this beautiful, this beautiful uh, column that he's going to use to call our life. But it takes our entire life in using Satan as a chisel to carve it. It's, that's what Job said when, when Satan went before Job in the first chapter of Job. And he said, God said, have you considered my servant Job that he's... A righteous man, he skeweth evil. <laughs> and Satan said, well, ain't no wonder he does this. You put a hedge around him, and you give him everything he ever wanted. He's the richest man of the East. You turn him over to me, and he'll curse you. God said, okay. He's in your hand. Well, the hand of God is evil man. Satan is nothing but a servant of God. He is the hand of God to carve our lives out, just like this lathe here. Just like this, this bow pop. And we have to do it. And he takes us on down here. But we can't do the sin in here. Because there's no opening for it. And, every, and our very nature is to go straight to sin. Isn't it? Unless there's something there restraining us. And without the restraint of God. Men will do the most evil things. You say I wouldn't. You haven't had the opportunity. I, God's put me in places in the music business. I, I would swore I would have never done those things. But I did. Sweet little Jimmy Brown. Eight, nine, ten years old. The sweetest little boy in the church. Would do that? Oh yes. It, there's nothing that any man won't do if God's restraining hair. Moves away from you. And he'll put all of this pride and arrogance in your life. And you say, I got to have that, that woman, that money, those things, that stuff, that pride, that position, that applause. I got to have it. And you're saying that inside yourself. And you'll do it. That's what God does. And Job said, after everything that Job had was destroyed, a wind came and blew down the house where his sons and daughters, seven sons and three daughters were eating, and he killed all of his kids. And Job said, The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. He did not say the devil took away. 
He said, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed. When he said, blessed be the name of the Lord, we sing, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Oh, that's a nice pretty song, but that ain't what Job was talking about. Job was saying, blessed be the Shem, the authority that killed my sons, my sons and daughters. He said, blessed be the authority, Shem is the word name. He said, I will curse the day I was born, but blessed be the authority that slaughtered my sons and daughters and that took away every bit of my substance. People say, and then the last verse of that first chapter says, right after he says, blessed be the name of the Lord, the Lord took away. The next verse, that's Job's words, and the next verse says, in all this, Job sinned not with his lips. God says, when Job talks about me, he tells the truth. I killed his kids. It was me, not the devil. Well, if it was God that killed him, that makes Satan the servant of God, doesn't it? Satan was doing nothing but the will of God. And in that second chapter, Satan said, well, the man evidently, he'll do anything to save his own skin. Skin for skin, he says, a man will do anything to save his life and save his flesh. Let me touch his body. And God said, okay, Satan, go ahead. Don't you dare touch his life. All right. See, Satan has to do the order of God. He was under the orders of the living God. Do you think Satan was actually telling God what to do? Or was he doing the will that God wanted him to do? He was doing the will of God. He was a carving tool. That's what he was. And then he strikes Job with boils from the head of his, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And Job's wife come in and says, why don't you curse God and die? What's really amazing is Job's wife knew who it was that did it. She said, it was God that did this to you. And she didn't say it was Satan. Now, Satan is involved in this. She says, and Job doesn't even mention Satan or bring him into the picture. Job looks at his wife and says, you speak like one of the foolish women. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not also receive evil from him? Job never mentioned, if you notice, Job never mentions Satan. He said, evil comes from God. And then the next phrase repeats the last verse of the first chapter. It says, in all this, Job sinned not with his lips, nor charged God foolishly. The Bible says, Job tells the truth when he talks about me. I slaughtered his family. And I love, look over here in Job. Go over here to Job, the 16th chapter. Now, people don't like this, Job. Sixteenth chapter. Now he has he's been condemned by these men, by his three acquaintances, they call themselves friends, and Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they're condemning Sir Job and saying, You evidently did something wrong. God is saying, No, I'm I'm his carving too. Let's read in the first verse. Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> That's really saying something. You are my three friends, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. You're miserable comforters. Shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? How bold can you be in saying these things? I also could speak as ye do if your soul were in my soul's stead. It would sure be easy if I was in your place and you were in mine to condemn you. That's real easy. 
And they were condemning Job, saying, you evidently did something really bad. You're a really bad sinner when men gets in this kind of trouble with God. And when you're Pentecostal in this day and time, they say, well, you're, the reason you're in trouble is you don't have faith and you've you're got a wicked and evilness in your life. And that's why God won't, that's why you've got so many troubles. No, they're like your life as Bill Dedden so far. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth if I was in your place. I wouldn't do what you're doing condemning me. And those were believers condemning him. And the moving of my lips would assuage your grief. I would try to comfort you. And you're condemning me. I mean, here he is. Lost everything he had. His sons and daughters are dead. And they're saying, well, there's something wrong with you. Boy, that's really compassion, isn't it? And they're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Y'all been in anybody in Pentecostal church has been there and they give you that hard time. Huh? <laughs> though I speak, my grief is not assuaged. And though I forbear, what am I eased? Though I put up with this. But now he hath made me weary. Thou hast made desolate all my company. And if thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me, and my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. He teareth me in his wrath who hateth me. He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpeneth his eye upon me. It reminds me of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, my enemies are waiting for my halting. They're waiting for me to trip up and fall. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me upon the cheek. Reproachfully, they have gathered themselves to gather against me. God hath delivered me to the ungodly. What? God hath delivered me over to the ungodly, and they're condemning me to give me a hard time. It's God that's doing it. Well, if he delivered me over to the ungodly, then he's in charge of their ungodliness, isn't he? And turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease when I had all the wealth of the world. But God hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck. Notice Satan is not in this picture at all. Job gives Satan no credit for nothing, does he? He says, God has taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark or his boundary line. Boy, that's a, let's finish reading this. His archers compass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. He breaketh me with a breach upon breach. God runs upon me like a giant. Whew. You see, this is what God will do to you when you belong to him. I have sewed sackcloth upon my skin and defiled my horn in the dust. My face is foul with weeping, and my eyelids is the shadow of death. Boy, he had to talk about dark circles under his eyes. Whew. Not for any injustice in my hands. Also, my prayer is pure. O earth, cover not thou my blood. Let my cry have no place. Also, now behold, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. God knows whether I am innocent or guilty in this situation. My friends scorn me when I'm having a hard time. But mine eye poureth out tears unto God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. After a few years, I'll die, and this will be all be over with. And when you're really down on the bottom, that's what you're thinking about, aren't you? I'll die, and it'll be over. So when people say, does God do this? 
Does God, is God sinning when he kills people? No. We have to learn that God doesn't think or talk the way we think or talk. Look over in Romans, the, the 8th chapter. The 8th chapter of Romans. Does God want man to be in his sin? Well, he better want him to be in his sin because the Bible says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that our names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. Well, let's read that. I'll read that to you and then I'll read this. I don't know what got me on this, but I guess this lady calling me saying, Does God sin? Does he want sin to happen? Yes, he wants sin to happen, and he's blameless. We have to get... When you're talking to somebody that don't believe in predestination, they're using an Americanized way of reasoning. You can't reason with God. You don't reason things out with him. He kills who he wants to kill. He sends to hell who he wants to, and he causes sin and murder and rape and pillaging and serial killers to happen, and he is blameless. He is righteous. So anything that's going on in your life, and everything that goes on in the world, everything, is working together for our good, isn't it? All of it. Now, he said that. We know that all things work together for good to them. To them, to who? Oh, to them that, what? Love? To them that walk in the commandments of God, right? All things work together for good to them that walk in the commandments of God because that's agape and that's that word. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. But they won't walk in the commandments of God unless they're elect, unless they're the church. To them who are, he says, we know that all things work together for good. Romans 8 and 28. We know that all things work together for good, agathos, A-G-A-T-H-O-S. The word is beneficial. People say, isn't God a benevolent God? The word beneficial, benefit, benevolent, all part of the same word. Uh, it's only beneficial. God is not a benevolent God to the world. My, my doctor, my cardiologist said, but isn't God a benevolent God? Well, not to you if you're not elect. God is only benevolent to his elect. That's what the Bible says. We know that all things work together for good. God is benevolent to them that love God. To them that love God. To them who are the called. According to his purpose. Now the word called is the word kaleo. Now all things work together for good to those that love God and to them, them who are the called. Because the called are those that love God. And love is agape. Walking in the commandments of God. So to them that walk in the commandments of God. But you won't walk in the commandments of God because there is none that understands None that seeks after God. Nobody seeks God. Well, who's going to walk in his commandments? Those that he births by his will, of his own will beget he us. Those that he's chosen before the foundation of the world. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. And he writes in fleshy tables of our hearts his law, his commandments, his love in Romans. Boy, I'm getting a bad habit then. In Romans, the fifth chapter. <laughs> In Romans, the fifth chapter, the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Well, what is that word love? Agape. Agape. So, <coughs> walking in the commandments of God. Goodness, I got so many places. Look here. Go to Romans 5. Go to Romans 5, and then I'll go back to Revelation. Romans 5. Huh? I'm going to get to Romans 8. I got my finger in there. I, I'm, not, I'm not leaving there. Romans 5. Romans 5. Now, look here. Everywhere you find this, this is the commandment of God. 
Romans 5. <clears throat> Let's read down to it. Uh, Starting verse 2. By whom also we have a, a access, speaking of Jesus, by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation... Philipsis. Remember that? We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And the word narrow is the way. Narrow is the word thalibo. It's a derivative of this word thalipsis. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience. People are always looking for an experience, aren't they? Huh? Well... They want to, I had an experience with God. I went down to the altar in this Baptist church, this Pentecostal church, and I went, whoopee, ah, hey, praise God, hallelujah. And I had an experience. Well, this word experience is the word dokime. <laughs> D-O-K-I-M-E. It means to test or trial. Test or trial. It uh, means to go through fire is what it means. Adokime means no fire, placing the alpha in front of a word, negates the word. Adokime is the word reprobate. People who don't like fire, they are reprobate. They don't want no fiery trials. That's what a reprobate is, is a man who wants a nice, easy, smooth life. Nice, good little Christian in a nice little church and a little picket fence, a little white house, and, you know, and just nice Sunday attendance and, and chicken for dinner, you know. Nice, nice church, churchy. I hate that kind of stuff, don't y'all? I just hate that attitude. And then he says, patience, experience, and experience, hope, Elpis, remember that? The L-P-I-S, not Elvis, but Elpis. Elpis means to anticipate with pleasure or expect a promise that's been made. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, hoped. The faith is the substance, the understanding of things hoped for. It's the word elpis. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. True. By the truth. The Holy Spirit is a person that puts truth and understanding of truth in our hearts. The word shed abroad is the word ekkeo, E-K-C-H-E-O. Same word is pour out of my spirit on all flesh. The Holy Spirit's truth. Same word is pour out. So God has poured out the agape in our hearts. What is it he's poured out in our hearts? The commandments of God in our hearts, hasn't he? You won't walk in them, and they won't work together for your good unless you belong to God. Unless you're the elect before the foundation of the world. They won't do you any good. You, you don't love God. People, I'm going to make a statement here. And I've made it before. All the commandments of God, and many, many more, the things that God commands you to do, the amount of God's commandments that you do shows how much you love God. And the amount of commandments you don't do shows just how limited the love of God is in your life. You don't love God as much as you think you do when you don't do the things that he says. He says, why do you call me Lord when you won't do the things that I say? When you don't tithe, you don't love God as much as you think. People say, I love God with all my heart. Don't tell me I don't love God. Uh, loving God is not a feeling. Loving God is not some assertive thing that you say with your lips. Loving God is what you do. It's walking in His commandments, isn't it? Everywhere you find love, and it's agape, just stick in walking after His commandments. Wherever it is. So when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, 
walking in the commandments of God is shed abroad in our hearts. It's the same thing as God writing on fleshy tables of the heart in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. It's the same thing as God writing upon our hearts in the 8th chapter of Hebrews. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, I write my laws in their minds, in their hearts while I write them, he says. I'm going to write them in your heart. But you don't have the agape of God in your heart unless he writes them there. That's predestination, isn't it? That's predestination. He's predestined us to conform to the likeness of Jesus and be like Jesus and walk in his commandments. And do what God says. <coughs> I keep saying, <coughs> well, Jesus said it. Jesus said in Matthew, the 15th chapter, words are cheap. That's what he said. Y'all know he said that, don't you? He said, this people honor me with their lips. He quotes it from the 29th chapter of Isaiah. Their hearts are far from me. Your lip service don't mean a thing without obedience. People who, I've had so many people come here and think they, all they're looking for is information. They don't want to do. They leave here. They won't separate from their families. They'll run around with a drinking, cussing parents. Just filthy mouth family. Well, yes, but I love my family and I'm never getting my family. You're not, you don't really love God, you love your family. The reason most people leave here is because that leave, I've had people come and they'll say, I watched some of your old tapes and not hardly anybody's here that was here back in 1998 or 96. And why do they leave? And every once in a while, somebody will get in a war with their family and they'll kind of fall out for a while and they won't come and I'll say, do you understand why people leave now? They just kind of drop their head. Yeah. It's because it gets so hard for them fighting their family all the time that they get discouraged and they kind of go home and sit down and quit. And some people, they feel such a necessity to have a reason to leave. They make up something about the preacher, about me. See, you can't make up something about Gerald and be, have a good reason to leave because he's not in a leadership position. He's just Gerald over sitting over there on the side. So that's not going to be good enough. You've got to make up something about me in order to leave. Isn't that right? See, that's what it is. So we make up something about Jim and, and Mary. One woman said they bought Mary a little sports car out of the ministry. I know we didn't, you knucklehead. Mary inherited some money from her mother, and she got a settlement on the job, and she kept that car for about three years and everything drive, and we sold it. But it was her money, and she could do what she wanted with it. Can, can I tell you what to do with what you inherit from your mother? Huh? Or what you get in a car wreck? Now, I've had, we've had people make up all kinds of stories in order to leave Grace and Truth Ministries. Don't make up stories, especially about me. Don't burn your bridges. Just say, Jim, I can't take it anymore. I'll say, okay. It'll be that simple. Say, come back when God deals with you, okay? That's the best thing to do. Don't see if you could burn a bridge and say, I'll accuse Jim of being an embezzler and, um, and um, doing this and doing that. And... Don't do that. You're burning bridges. You might want to walk back over it. God might deal with you down the road. And you know why some people won't come back? They're too embarrassed when they find out they've been fools. Pride won't let them. Boy, pride is a, pride will kill you. That's exactly it. And we do have people come back from time to time. But do you know who the people who come back? The ones that you leave without making a stink and a noise. Those are the ones that come back. It gets tough. This is a tough message, isn't it? It's tough as nails. I'm telling your family that Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and you have to agonize over sin. If they don't agonize and they're not taking their cross and dying daily, if they're not suffering tribulation somewhere in their life, they don't belong to God. Their vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and predestination is true. And Boy, you tell people these things and it's not so much telling them one time. It's trying to take a stand for it every time you see them. That's the hard part. Now, let me kind of advise some of you on this. You think, you think, I'm so miserable fighting my mother and my brothers and my sisters every time I see them. And I, this is going to be this bad from now on. No, it's not. 
let me tell you the secret. The thick secret is to stand. Having done all to stand. 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 And when you stand, they start falling away after the second year. After the third year, they start going, well, there's Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? I've, I've got to run. And they just run away from me. I have people that used to scream and fuss and fight me when they see me now. Hi. Jim, it's, I'm, it's Christmas time. It's about three weeks before Christmas. And they're going, I don't have time to stop and talk. And they're running away. They don't want to talk to me three weeks before Christmas. And they're real, real friendly to me. People that used to hate me and scream at me and yell at me over believing these things. If you stand, a lie is not as strong as the truth. If you stand and keep standing, they get to where they can't take it. But most people, the reason most people give up is they stand one time and they got such flack that the next time they won't mention it, they won't. And the family says, so here's your present. I know you don't believe in Christmas. So here it is anyway. And you go, okay. And you've just put your approval on everything they did. When you take one gift, one, then they walk away saying, he don't mean what he's saying. He's just going to some old cult thing, some cult thing, and he don't mean it. He'll be all right after a while. And then they've got you running. And then you go up and try to stand again. And say, wait a minute, you took a gift last time. And then you're in another fight again. What you have to do is stand straight down the line and don't compromise at all. And in about two to three years, I've said this so many times, when the first year is the hardest, oh man, your family screams and yells and say you're in a cult and you're listening to some nut out there and he's crazy and, and I'm going to call the law on you. I'm going to have you investigated. His mother's going to have me investigated. She's going to investigate me. What really gets me, uh, Marcus' his mother go have me investigate, and she's a Mormon. <laughs> and, and his mother and his ex-wife are going to have me investigate it. She's a Baptist, and the mother-in-law is a Mormon. These two are going to get together to have me investigate, and they hate each other. Their doctors hate each other. But that's funny. But after this, when the second year gets here, and you've stood all year long. Here's what happens. They see you coming. They're still a little uncomfortable, but they have heard some friends. The first year you take a stand that Christmas is pagan. It's paganism. And the first year, they get mad and scream and yell, like my brother. I give it up like Christmas. And he's screaming at me. He didn't even believe in God. You know, he believed the Bible's written by men. And I said, don't give up Christmas until God deals with the heart to live godly and holy and righteous. Don't give up anything. I mean, this is a, ride, this is a theme park. Ride all the rides. If you're going to hell, go ahead and ride all of them. I mean, why would you quit doing Christmas? You're going to keep drinking and smoking. Huh? It don't make any sense. And cussing. I'll tell you one thing, Blake, if you like. Give me a beer. I quit doing Christmas. I mean, <laughs> that's going to help you, isn't it? Lordy mercy. But uh, by the third year, and I promise you this happens, by the third year they're so uncomfortable, they've talked to their friends, their friends have said, they go to a lot of friends and say, do you know what my sister's doing? Do you know what my brother's doing? They're going to a cult out in Hendersonville that says Christmas is pagan. And their sister says, well, I know it's pagan. They go, What? You know it's pagan? Well, yeah. I thought everybody knew it's pagan. I didn't know it was pagan. I don't know. And they start mumbling. And they go to several friends that say, Oh, yeah, we knew it's pagan. Because too many people know it's pagan and know it's heathenism. And, and boy, that really confuses them. But their friends that they tell, their friends that say, Well, we know it's pagan. We're going to do it. We like it. We like gifts. We like presents. We like the party. It ain't religious to them. And they'll talk to so many people. And this is true of predestination or anything else. When you stand, by the third year, they get to where they don't even want to talk to you. When they see you in public, they'll run away from you. They won't get up to you and scream and yell like they did the first year. They've talked to too many people. They've read articles in magazines. They've seen, seen things in newspaper. They've seen things on TV like Christmas Unwrapped. And they're going, oh, my gosh, oh, goodness. 
and they are so uncomfortable that they grow to have a respect for you that they that you don't even know that they have and this happens and if but what makes you lose credibility with them is you give in you give in you take that gift you don't open your mouth you try to the first time you open your mouth then they yell you down then you go back and you don't open your mouth the second time or the third time then you try to open your mouth the fourth time and then you have a fight with them they say you've been coming around not taking a stand for it and then time you get six months down the road you're so uncomfortable you say I, I don't, and three years down the road you said I can't handle this anymore I'm leaving grace and truth it's because you've never grown never matured and never stood you've got to stand and keep standing and once you keep standing you get strong and they get weak because there's no such thing as a lie being as strong as the truth it is not possible you just keep standing and I've said that for years. And that's because the love of God is written in your heart. Luke 14, verse, 28. verse 28, Luke 14. Boy, that's one of my favorite chapters. I like that. We'll read that. You have to count the cost, don't you? That's what you have to do. That's what he says. And the cost is high. It costs you your family and your friends. That's what it costs. Verse 28, well, he says in verse 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You have to crucify self continually, not once, and then don't crucify yourself the next two times you get around your friends and family. Participate one Christmas party, not another, and then participate two or three more, not another. And then you get to where you kind of stay away and hide from your family because you're not willing to take a stand all the time. Which of you intending... To build a tower, and he's talking about counting the cost of standing for Christ. Which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost. The word counteth the cost, whether you have sufficient to finish it. This is a, this is, we're going to finish this building of the house of God. And the word counteth is the word P-S-E, P-H-I-Z-O, P-S-E. P-H-I-Z-O. It's pebbles. They actually used pebbles to count what the cost was in building a building. It was not unlike the little Japanese computer where they would push the little beads along there. They used, you have to count what it takes. And you know what it takes? Everything you've got. The, the thing that people are worried about is how miserable they're going to be before it's over with. That's what most people are worried about. Do you know that? That's why they can't keep standing. Oh, gosh, uh, I've stood and I'm so miserable. He tells you what the cost is in verse 33. So likewise, whosoever... Well, let's read down to it. Lest happily he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, you lay the foundation, you go to your family, tell them about predestination and Christmas, and you can't finish it, so they start making fun of you and laughing at you. All that behold it begin to mock him, and they start laughing at you because you won't finish what you started. And that's why you usually end up leaving grace and truth, because you won't finish the work you started. You won't stand up for what the truth is. When you really finish the building, you really get content and happy, I know some of you are real unhappy, but I've never been this happy in my whole life because I'm standing every day, constantly, around the clock. Truth is my foundation 24 hours a day. My wife will tell you that. That's all I want to talk about, the Word of God and truth. This is my life. If it becomes your life and you... You eject everything else. And I'm not talking about don't love your immediate family that you're with, the ones that believe the truth, and don't love your... I'm not talking about don't be responsible on your job. I mean, the first thing in your life should be Christ. The first. Your job and family. Your family is second. And your job is way back there. The first thing in our life should be Jesus, shouldn't it? First. And then he says... 
And they're mocking you, saying, this man began to build. He came, began to come over here and talk to us about predestination. And he don't finish anything he starts. He compromises. He quit this last time. Then he comes back another time. And he tries to start building again. And then he comes back. And then two or three times he visits us. He don't mention any. He talks and he lets me have my way. You think your family are so stupid they can't tell when you're letting them have your, their way? Yes, they can tell. But you don't ever let people have their way. You say, this is God's way. This is what I believe. And that's why we don't come around you. You want to learn and believe truth? I'll be around you. It's not because I don't like you. I told Mary, I said, it's not because I don't like your family. She's got a brother-in-law that's the nicest guy in the world. I've got a brother-in-law down over in Oklahoma. As good a man as ever walked upon the face of the earth. He'll help you do anything. Quiet, gentle guy, great big tall guy. Just as gentle as a lamb. He'll rescue you on anything. He'll go out of his way. But he doesn't want to live in truth. I talked to him for about 40 minutes here. a couple, About five or six years ago. And I taped it. And I'm just very gentle and firm with him. And I'm saying, Jerry, you have to take your cross and die. I didn't even try to get in condemning my younger brother in the whole thing. He was trying to say, well, I have a heart for Dean. And I wanted to say, you have an understanding for false doctrine? But I didn't even say that. I just kept saying, if you don't go through tribulation and trials, you can't be a disciple of Christ. You have to take your, you have to take your cross and die daily. And he kind of, at first he was defending himself. And at the end of the conversation, I got the tape. I'll give it to some of you. Let some of you listen to it. It'll show you how to talk to your family. Because I've said the things that he needed to hear. And finally at the end of it he said, Jimmy, I just, I'm not ready to live that way. That was his final answer. I'm just not ready to live like that. And I said, well, if you believe, belong to God, you must. Now there was a time when me and Butch would go around him and he was a good guy and everything's okay, but I wasn't trying to live for the Lord back then. And he's done the most un unbelievable things. One time I, I was in a van and, and I, I blew a wheel out over in Little Rock and he, he was a, a firefighter over in Memphis and I called and I said, Jerry, I'm in trouble. I broke down over here right outside Little Rock. And a few hours later he drove up with another van and a trailer and and, and just, he got out and said, okay, put your stuff in there. Take off, I got this. I can take care of this. He can fix anything. He got out there on the highway and changed that wheel and fixed it and took the van back to Memphis. I mean, he'd come rescue me anywhere. Now, you say, I got a, a family member that's the best, I, and I, I just can't treat them this way. You know, there ain't a person here that's got anybody in their family that was better than my brother-in-law. Nobody. But I can't fellowship with him unless he wants the truth. Do you understand? I can't do that. Not because I don't like him. I do like him. He is one of the most likable people I have ever met in my life. But I can't fellowship with him because I like him. Not unless he wants to hear truth all day long. And he don't. Liking your family member has nothing to do with how you're supposed to be living toward them. If you're going to love them, don't have anything to do with whether you like them or not. Walking God's commandments around them. The hardest thing to do is pull away from a family member that you dearly have this great affection for. Isn't it? But if you really love them, you pull away from them and say, until you live righteously, I can't deal with you anymore. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? Because I know everybody here has a problem with that, don't you? Everybody. How much time do I have? Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. Let's finish this. I didn't even get to the subject I was going to. Let's finish this here in Luke 14. And they laugh at you and say, this man comes one day and then he doesn't. He kind of messes around and goofs up. And then he comes back and tries to stand another time. That's not standing. That's being wishy-washy. Isn't it? That's straddling the fence. Nobody likes the fence straddler, not even the enemy. 
They don't respect you because you tell them predestination one time and you don't have the guts to stand up for it again. You say, Jim, I'm just not strong enough. They'll stay away from them until you get strong. Yeah, he said, if you're lukewarm, he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God said, you make me sick being lukewarm. Oh, what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. You better know that you got a better army than the other man. Don't start this thing and don't finish it, Jesus is saying. Like the old saying, don't start something you can't finish. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage or ambassadors and desireth conditions of peace. And that's what we do when we're fighting the enemy. Let's make peace, and I won't mention predestination anymore, and I won't talk about Christmas because you jump on me every time I do, and I'm just... Huh? Yeah, agree to disagree, my foot. No, no. God says, I don't do that. He says, I won't. He says, I will not. My, he said, my counsel is immutable. The word immutable, ametathetos is the word. It means I will not meet your conditions. That's what it means. It means I will not change my law to fit you. I don't come to where you are. You come to where I am. So when you stand for truth, you tell, you're going to have to tell the people that you like in your family, I don't, I don't come to any other ground than where I stand. Brother-in-law, sister-in-law, I have loved you in the past. I have an affection you like nobody. I don't think I've ever had a man in my life I loved like I love my brother-in-law, Jerry. He was my brother. And it breaks my heart that he doesn't want to live in truth. Never had a friend like that. And my sister, I was so close to her. You're not as close to your family as I was to mine. Me and my sister were very, very close. But I have to take a stand. I'm not going to go over and... I wish Jimmy would come back. Somebody said, Clyde said, I wish Jimmy would come back and be the way it used to be. Oh, you mean we'll talk about your wallpaper and Janice's flower bed and where you went fishing, how big the fish was you caught, and where you're going on vacation, and if I mention predestination and, and I mention Christmas is pagan, somebody's going to get upset. Oh, Jimmy, we don't need to talk about that around here. I ain't coming there. If you, I, think can't talk. I love Jesus. I like Jesus better than I like you. And that's to boil down to that. We're not talking about just agape. We're talking about phileo. You're going to have to phileo Jesus better than you phileo your family. And I like him better. I got some people now in my family I liked very much. I really liked Clyde. He was my hero. He rescued me all the time when I was a kid. Someone would beat me up. Clyde would go out there and he'd fight a hole. He'd fight everybody. He'd take on 10 guys to rescue me. And if you said Clyde, it was, <laughs> there was one word in our family. It was one word to say Clyde and Jimmy. It was one word, Clyde and Jimmy. Where's Clyde and Jimmy? Clyde and Jimmy come to supper. Get Clyde and Jimmy. We, we, our name was one. You think that don't bother me? But I can't fellowship with Clyde. He just is so ignorant, and he's proud of it. He said to me one day, Well, Jimmy, I believe in predestination, but I believe i got a free will to do whatever I want to do. Oh, do you believe up is down? Do you believe backwards is forward, and sour is sweet, and sweet is bitter? Can you fellowship with that? Knowing this? I can't. You mean I'm going to go somewhere with Clyde when I can go with Gerald or Clyde. Who am I going to pick? Gerald or Clyde? I'm going to pick Gerald. When I can go somewhere with one of y'all or with Jim. Or... I would rather go talk to Jim than I had. Well, I'd rather talk to anybody in the world. This is not a very good compliment. 
just say, and then talk to Dean. <laughs> That's not a really good comparison. I'm sorry. I even compared you to that. But I loved Clyde, and I loved Janice, and I loved Jerry. And I, Clyde came through town one time back in the 80s, and he sat on my couch, and I started talking to him about predestination. And he's, he's like a little boy, and he said, hey, hey, you know, Jimmy, that's really good. I, I, I think I could, I, I think I could understand that. And he's just excited and so nervous, and he talks about three times or five times as fast as I talk. Just, he said, I, I think I can believe that. I think I, I think I believe that. And Olivia's sitting right next to him and said, we don't believe that. And he said, oh. And he, there they go. Whatever she says, that's what Clyde's going to believe. Yeah, she's, she'll beat him up probably. All right, now where was I? Let's read the rest of this. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an abbasage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, cannot be my disciple. You have to forsake all. That don't mean give everything away. That means to put everything in second place to God and say, I will live in truth and tell truth. If you steal everything I got and all my family leaves me and forsakes me, and that will happen too. And look over here. Well, it takes, boy, going through this. Salt is good. We're the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? If the salt has lost his savor, moreno. Moreno, we get the word moros or moron from that. You have to look like a fool from the world's viewpoint. The, the context isn't changed, even though you got the little mark in there like it's a new subject. It's not a new subject. When this happens, when you forsake all, people will say, you're nuts. You've forsaken everything. You've walked away from your family. If you can't be in truth, I can't be around you. If the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? We have to be fools for Christ. We have to be like the savor of the salt. And the word means insipid. It's lost its savor. means insipid. It has no taste. Do you know we're the taste of the world? We're what makes the world tasty. Everything else is boring. Interest rates and adjust rate mortgages and discount points are boring. To me. And if you lose your if you lose your savor, it is neither fit. Euthetos is the word. It comes from you and Tithame. Tithame means to level, a well leveling. It's not even fit. You're not leveling to the will of God. It's not fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. Now, whenever they, they would use salt to kill the stink of dung. And they would put it on dung heaps. And it'll kill it. And Paul said, all of our accomplishments in life are dung. And we have to be the salt that's put on the dung heap and we have to look like fools when we're giving up the world. And when we walk in the commandments of God, which is what we're predestined to, we look like fools, don't we? And you have what you're worried about when you get around your family, you're worried about looking like a fool, aren't you? That's the problem. And you're worried about them not liking you because you want to like them. Whether I'm walking the commandments of God or whether I'm a God, whether I am having an agape towards my brother-in-law has nothing to do with whether I like him because I can't keep from liking him. But as to whether I can't like him and have an agape to him at the same time. Now, when he won't walk in the commandments of God and won't do what God says, do you know my liking him begins to recede? I begin to like him less and less and less. And I don't like him now like I used to because he doesn't want to believe God. I don't like him like I used to. If I'm around him now, I'm quite sure I wouldn't be able to talk to him the way I used to. Well, this liking, 
This phileo and agape, this is a hard thing to get a hold of, isn't it? You can't like and you can't agape. Your liking will be there, but it'll get less and less and less when you get repulsed and disgusted at somebody who refuses to walk in the commandments of God. It's neither fit for the land nor for the dung hill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That is a command. That's an imperative mood. Gosh, I'm out of, just about out of time. I was going to show you. Let me go back. Let me go back to Romans 8. Boy, I, I mean, I left the message tonight behind. Go back to Romans 8. He would say, who makes man to be a sinner? The Bible says God made him to be a sinner. Right here. Romans 8, verse 20. For the creature. Now, the creature is talking about a new creation. The word is katesis. K-T-S-I-S. Katesis is the same word. We're new creatures in Christ. This is talking about not the creature, not a creature when we use the word creature. Oh, it's an animal, it's a, it's a man, it's a tiger, it's a lion. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the new creation. Because he's talking about that all through here. He says in verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, sons of God are those who do the will of the Father, as many as are led by the Spirit, in verse 14, are sons of God. So we are waiting for the manifestation of those that are led by the Spirit of God. That's what this is saying. You can't read verse 19 without reading verse 14. And then he says, For the creature, or the new creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly. Man was made subject to mataiotes, which means transientness or profitlessness or idolatry, but not by his will. Man was made subject to vanity when God put him in the garden, and it was by the will of God he was made subject to sin. That's what this is saying. Man was made subject to sin, but not by his own will. He was put in a body that couldn't keep from sinning, he was made of corrupt dust that was corrupted between, between Genesis 1-1 1, 1 and 1-2. One, and that's when Satan was cast into the earth and he corrupted the dust of the earth. And then God picked up the dust and made man out of that corruption. And then he makes a tree and puts it in the garden. <coughs> he has previously made Satan and put a glitch in him so he would sin and would fall because God could have made him where he couldn't have fallen, wouldn't he? Couldn't he? But he didn't. So he puts the tree in the garden he puts Satan in heaven, and sin is found in Satan. Pride is found in him because God put it there, and he's got a glitch. God has Michael cast him to the earth. Then he corrupts the earth, makes man out of the dust. Then he puts Adam in the garden, puts a tree in the garden, says you can't keep from partaking of it. Now, let me give you a command. Thou shalt not. Well, that don't make any sense to us, does it? And Adam, you will, and the day you eat thereof, you will die. He didn't say, if you eat of it. He said, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And it's coming. So God made Adam subject to sin, but it wasn't by the will of Adam, but by reason of him who subjected Adam in hope. By reason, it was God's reason that he made Adam subject to vanity because God has an elect family that he wrote their names down before the world began. God better make sure there's some sin in the world if, he, if Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Because if Jesus was the lamb slain and nobody sins, well, we got a problem, don't we? I've run out of time. I hadn't even finished this, and I'm... But you can go to the 13th chapter of Revelation and you'll find that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And in the 17th chapter that our names are written in the book of life before the world began. Let me encourage you to stand in truth. The reason people can't, the reason people don't get strong, it's kind of like going to the 
second grade or third grade and saying, this is too hard, I think I'll quit. Well, go on and go through school and graduate and you'll find out it's not as hard as you thought. Go on through school. Finish. Finish the work. Count the cost. It takes a lot to finish it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to stand in these times. Lord, I know it's so difficult for people to stand. They got too many people in their family they're like. Teach us to love them, Lord, with your agape, to walk in the commandments, to withdraw from them, to be angry at sin, to to separate, to humble, to agonize over our sin, and to do the things in the world that we're supposed to do in front of these people. And God will continue to praise you and glorify you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'll get back to the Reverend Gregory subject Sunday. That's right. He sent Jesus to die for nothing if God doesn't want sin. That's right. He wanted sin, but he's not a sinner. And he's got some sinners that he'll make, he'll cause to sin, and then he'll hold us accountable, and he won't be accountable. Now, but that is not American way of thinking, is it? No, not at all. That's not American. You can't, you can't look at the Bible and try to figure out how God thinks, can you? Hey. Can't stand unless we're in the program, can we? Yeah, that's right. If you can't stand the heat, stay out of Miami. That's right. <laughs> right. Hey, Butch, what are you doing? Well, it's hard on us, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, you know, I've loved them. Well, I love them, but, but they don't want to be in this. Well, you'd think that he would... But he got real gentle with me on the phone. Because I remember we used to go.